feel all of the energy and the excitement in this room. There is so much ground to cover, and I want to get to as much of it as we can. So we are going to kind of do a, a lightning speed round of introductions here. Uh, and just each say who we are and a tiny little bit about what we do. I am Alex Cohen. I'm a political anchor at Spectrum News, which is how I have the fun fact, even though we saw the political strides that uh, we have made here in California, I do want to know that for the first time in more than 30 years, we will no longer have a woman representing us in the U.S. Senate. There is that. But on a lighter note, ladies, <laughs> you know what we do. Well, I'll start. Hi, everyone. Holly Martinez, the Executive Director of the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. <laughs> So we have two pieces of legislation pending in Congress that would actually bipartisan legislation, by the way, 
that would actually move the Equal Rights Amendment closer than, uh, to fruition and being published in the Constitution. In 2020, we've met all the requirements to have the Equal Rights Amendment in there. It's been ratified by all the states needed to. It has bipartisan support. We just need to get in the Constitution. And let's remember, our votes matter. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure, but it's an election year. So think about all of the things that are on the ballot right now. Well, your fundamental rights and freedoms are on the ballot. And take that to, with you when you go to the polls. You missed it because this is what I do. As I was driving over, we learned that uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene upset about the, the origin of the uh, federal government shutdown, and Mike Johnson, working with Democrats, has filed a motion to oust him. I mean, Congress is, is a little cuckoo right now <laughs> in Washington, D.C., if I may put it so bluntly. So, can you talk specifically about you know, what are the dynamics at play here, and with so much else that Congress is facing, why hasn't this happened yet? Politics and money are the reason we do not have constitutional equality in our country. So, and we're not a person, none of us here are partisan in our roles, but we have to admit that there are people who are running for president right now are the reason why we don't have an equal rights amendment in our constitution. They said no, thank you. Because their political interests behind them said that this shouldn't happen. And that's why I mean, elections have consequences and our votes matter. So making sure that we vote for the people who represent our interests are so very important for us to move forward as a country. And I mean, I'm from DC, I, I grow up there, I still live there, and it is nuts. I mean, it's not just a swamp physically, but there is a swamp, right? Um, and it's because our system is set up to polarize us. Our, our political system is set up to reinforce these divisions amongst us so that we can all focus on things that are not important. What's important to us? Our livelihoods, our families, and our community. But we don't really focus on that. We focus on social issues instead. Let's come together and talk about the things that really matter to us, our kitchen table issues, our economy. And that's what the Equal Rights Amendment is at the foundation of it. The reason it hasn't succeeded at this to this point is because of money. There are financial interests at stake. So we need to take that, that money and that power back, put it, give it to the people, and make sure that we're doing what we need to to move this forward. Because our elected officials don't represent us. The majority of us don't have elected officials that represent us. So we need to make sure that changes. And that's what we're aiming to do. California is not perfect, but we're pretty special, I think, in a lot of ways. We're amazing, right? <laughs> like, look around this room. Yeah, well, talk to me about what we're doing here where we might, because we saw the data backs us up. We are doing better than the national average. Why is that? While you're out there in D.C. doing the big battle for us, I think we are extraordinarily lucky that we have leadership that does represent so much of the interests of Californians and women. Um, we have uh, people who are fighting day in, day out for policies that really do support our ability to thrive. And that includes uh, first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Uh, she, and on your table, everybody, there is the Sign the Equal Pay Pledge, uh, which is just one example of how over 200 companies have taken the pledge to say that they believe that they have the power and will move to end the wage gap. They're going to look at their internal data, they're gonna look at their policies, they're gonna look at their pay structures, and they're gonna make action, take action to make that change. Um, I was really excited to uh, have Ann see the report featured the pink tax. Um, that was a huge policy win that the commission fought tooth and nail for. Believe me, we were called job killers. We were we were called a lot of names about that bill, um, and we had Commissioner Senator Monique Lamo continue to fight to get that through the legislature and signed by the governor, which makes it possible for when you go to apply for a job, there is a pay range published, so that women who have historically, um, you know, started at the lower level um, can't ever close the gap if we're starting at that deficit. So now the policy isn't perfect, California isn't perfect, there's so much more work we need to do. Um, so we would need to like marry this initiative of businesses making the right choices with policies that ensure that women do not fall through the crack, that they're held accountable, and that they ultimately are succeeding in the workplace. We cannot succeed in the workplace if we have to take care of our children, right? <laughs> Let's just put it out there. It's a real issue. And Gail, 
Uh, could you give us an update, both statewide and nationally, where do affordable child care initiatives currently stand, and how do you see that factoring into the gender wealth gap that we're seeing? Yeah, so um, at the Women's Bureau, one of the things that we do is uh, release data, uh, both we analyze other data and we do our own data analysis, and we put out policy briefs and various different research. And one of the um, important pieces that we did this uh, in this past year is called the National Database of Child Care Prices. And if you look at that database, you can look it up on the county level. It's the only resource in the nation that's looking at child care on the county level. And no surprise to anyone, child care is unaffordable. So, um, you know, on average, a child's uh, child care could range from 8% of a family's, and this is for one child, 8% of a family's budget to 19% of the family budget. Uh, and in the bigger, the bigger cities that you live in, the more expensive child care is. So it's really important. We know that when women's, when child care costs go up, women's labor force participation goes down. So this is an issue that we've absolutely been working on from the federal government. Uh, one of the things that the Biden-Harris administration has been particularly interested in is as we're getting more women into the jobs created by the bipartisan infrastructure law and CHIPS and IRA and all these new um, infrastructure dollars that are going on throughout the country, how can we make sure that women come into those jobs and stay in those jobs? And the key to that is ensuring that they have access to child care. So that's on one of our top of our lists. Uh, when you mentioned some of the child care prices right now, I heard a couple of wows from over here, right? And if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't, and that's understandable. Um, but as we heard from the president earlier, education plays such a key role in all of this. And uh, one statistic that I was pretty floored by, 80% of the nation believes that the Equal Rights Amendment was already enacted. <laughs> You know, we laugh, but I, I, you know, like we're also living in 2024, and I think we could see where a lot of people would be like, how could it not be that case? Zakia, so can you talk to us a little bit about education and messaging and the role that this plays? Yes, yeah, so we are in a university that probably does talk about the Equal Rights Amendment and some of their curricula, but many of us went to schools that didn't talk about it, right? So, I mean, that's something that we have to take into consideration. It's what you know should not be determined by where you grew up. Let's just say that. Um, so education is important. We all need to inform our peers. We need to educate ourselves about the importance of this work. The Equal Rights Amendment is the foundation for all of the work we talk about when it comes to women and girls in particular, but others, other parts of our, our society that are being attacked and infringed upon today. So for us, it's important for people to know that, yes, though 80% of the country thinks we have it, we don't. And there, that's the problem. That's why we had the Dobbs decision a couple of years ago. That's why we still see the stagnant wage gap, because you can't fight that. And so imagine what the world would be like if we actually had that 50 years ago. How would your life be different right now if you had an equal rights amendment in the Constitution that actually protected you against wage theft, that actually protected you against violence against a gender-based violence, that protected you against all of the ills that we see right now attacking the LGBTQ plus community? That's what we're talking about right now. This is why education is so important, because we need to let people know that it's not in there, and that's why we have the situations that we have today. So, you're all here. I would say like, what, 100,000 people here? <laughs> um, so think about what, what would that mean if you were to go to your community and talk about this issue in particular, the moment we have in history to correct that. We can do this this year if we have the political will and support to do so. So all of you, get on your phones, take them out, talk on social media, amplify the ERA Coalition, at ERA Coalition, visit us on our website, learn more about your rights and what's at stake right now, because if you don't act now, we miss a window, and we can't wait another 100 years for this. Not one more year. It's been 100 years we waited for the Equal Rights Amendment. 50 years since it was passed. Think about that. And the impact that that could have on our lives in the future. So, educate yourself, visit our website, learn about the partners that are doing the work in your community, because that's how you uplift this issue, and ultimately uplift all of us in the process. reasons that maybe people aren't quite aware of everything that's happening in our nation right now is that in many ways we live in a bubble and we have been living in a bubble and I think it's safe to say that COVID-19 really emphasized that. Uh, the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls examined the impact 
of COVID-19. They put together a California blueprint for pandemic women's economic recovery. Holly, talk to us a little bit about the findings there and how are we, it's weird, right? Like this wouldn't have happened in 2020, this room. And I think it's, you know, a lot of us feel like, oh, this is behind us. And yet it's not in a lot of ways. Give us kind of a temperature lead. Yeah, I think it's really important to recognize that we're not through the crisis that has propelled on our society. We know that, yes, we're seeing women return to the workforce in historic numbers, but they continue to stay in low paying jobs. And that's just unacceptable. We have to be able to figure out how do we support women, women who put their careers on hold to care for their children, to educate their children, um, years of lost savings into their retirements. Uh, one thing our blueprint found is that women who were college educated, didn't have children, made gains in the workforce. They, were, they moved on, they got promotions, they saw raises. What does that say about, you know, how our structures are not built for working mothers in general? So I think, you know, when you think about the state of women, it's, uh, I, I'm not good with the status quo. I'm not good waiting 100 more years. I think the economic opportunity and the power women have in this room as consumers, as decision makers, as um, carrying the most important industries forward, they taught our kids. Women were the ones caring for our loved ones in hospitals. They were the frontline workers we all talked about. We just happened to not say that they were women. So now is the time to really um, recognize and acknowledge them for this work, pay them fairly, yes. and you know, and pay them a living wage enough to make them thrive, knowing that they are half of our workforce and keep our women our time. When I was a little kid. I lived under the assumption that the longer you were around, the harder you worked. I thought, well, then, like, the more experience you have and the smarter you get. So you would just be keep making more and more and more and more. I've right? seen lots of shaking heads, right? And then I heard, aha, right? Maybe some women over a certain age in this room have seen firsthand that that isn't always how it works. And uh, Gail, you know, we saw earlier today some of the, the bigger pictures of women, but I want to break it down with this statistic. Uh, women graduate now with degrees at higher rates than men. They begin their careers making close to the same starting salaries as their male counterparts. And then comes the job. Right, and we're seeing a steep drop off in earnings, especially among women ages 25 to 44. Can you break this down for us? What is going on here? Yeah, so <laughs> that makes me think about when when I was a young mom. I uh, my children are now 22 and um, about to be 20. And um, when I was a young mom. My husband's aunt, who is like my mother-in-law, I was like one day really stressed out. I was dealing with my own mom who um, had early onset Alzheimer's and having small kids at home and trying to figure out how to have a career after graduate phase or finishing graduate school. It was all just swirling around me. And she said to me, oh honey, you can, you can have it all, just not at the same time. And I think, you know, fast forward 20 years from that moment, what have we been doing to make that change? Because we all want to be able to have that balance, whether or not you know, you're men or women, everybody wants to be able to care for their loved ones when they need to and be there for um, their own health care and others. So, you know, first I do want to say that um, women have are in the workforce at record numbers, um, it's the highest rate of participation in the workforce for 25 to 54 year old women right now, uh, which is great. And also, if you compare us to our peer nations that have invested in uh, policies like paid leave and childcare, looking at just Germany and Canada, two of those countries, we released recent research just last week that shows that if we had invested in those policies like paid leave and childcare, like Germany and Canada do, we'd have five million more women in the workforce, and we'd have $775 billion a year more in our economy. So that's really, um, it's the gap we have, and it's what our nation is really dealing with. And, you know, lucky in California to be one of the leaders in paid leave, to be the leader in paid leave in the nation. It's, 
you know, we hear about what they're doing in other countries, and it's hard. I, I want to kind of try to imagine a better world right now. If you could maybe wave a magic wand, and all the goals and things we're talking about here started to happen, things started to turn. Can you give us a sense, and if you will start with you, like what would that actually, what would our nation look like for the day? <laughs> I see you sign, but can you imagine maybe some of the changes that we don't even think about yet? Yeah, so I sighed because unfortunately, I don't know a world where the equality I'm seeking exists. And so for me, it is to imagine this thing because there's so many examples of how lives could be changed and lives could be different. I love the statistic of looking at other countries and the investments that you make in women and girls and what that could mean for you. I mean, we, it's, a, it's ridiculous to think that over the course of a lifetime, a Latino woman will miss out on $1.3 million because of the wage gap. Like, that's mind boggling. What could that mean for our economy, for our children, for our families, if people were empowered with those? So for me, it would be we'd have a stronger system, we'd have more opportunities as women, and our, and our girls wouldn't have to worry about a world in which they're not getting a 527 plan because they're a girl versus a boy, right? And I mean, this is why this report is so fascinating and so mind-boggling, because the world we want is one where everyone in this room right now has the life that they deserve because of the hard work they've put in and because of the situations and the advancement that they've invested in themselves. And we need to make that real for everyone, not just women, not just girls, but for all of us. And that's why I believe in the Equal Rights Movement, because it will do just that. It will empower us to make the change we need to see in this world, to make the world we want to have. And so for me, it's being able to have families that can afford to take paid leave, right? Because well, there were some recent statistics also about the fact that if you, the lack of paid leave for black and brown women, what that means in terms of quality of life overall. If you do not get a break, what does that mean for you? Um, so maybe it would be some time all the time, right? That might be, that might be a benefit where our health insurance covers us for all the needs that we have, but it's not prohibitively expensive. So you can actually go and get preventative care and live a longer and more full life, knowing that you don't have to worry about those kinds of things. Where our education system is set up so that all of us can advance, so we can take advantage of the opportunities that are in the world, and we can move our country forward, because that's how we're gonna get it done, is through education, health, and supporting our I, I, when I harken back to what you say, Gail, about that lesson, if you can have it all, but not at once. I just always say you can have it all, but just not sleep. And it gets back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Rest is really important. Can you want to chime in a little bit about what that looks like here in California when it comes to women in these caregiving roles? Yeah, I think we, we talk a lot about mothers, but I think what that looks like is a woman doesn't have to choose between whether she's going to be a good mother a good daughter to her aging parents, a good employee, somebody who is uh, not really selfish about putting our ambitions first, um, you know, and, and honestly, uh, not risking our own health and wellness because we are trying to fill these impossible demands of our time that's um, not valued by our society. So I kind of, you know, from a big global level, that's all the policy work, the cultural change, the transformation we need to see. And I always think about it to like, how do I bring it back to myself? I'm raising these two human beings who, uh, they are my mission in life, to create these human beings that value their worth as they deem worthy, not, especially for my daughter who, uh, you know, her value is not determined by what anybody else thinks. And that is really my goal is to raise that and to raise a son who knows that he is part of that solution and part of that equation. And I think we all have to look and see how do we bring these big aspirational and sometimes overwhelming um, systemic changes to our own lives and our everyday actions. And so that's really, you know, I think what we need to have happen. So as this session is winding to a close, I want everyone to take note of the fact that on your tables there, uh, there are some opportunities to take action. And I know it's so hard because we're here, we're here in this moment, we're all feeling inspired, and then you know, you'll go back to work this afternoon or next week, and then it's like, oh, now what? what do I do? So I'd like to spend a little time with each of you, and Gail will start with you. For women, for girls in this state, in this country today, what are some of the actionable items that we all can do to move towards a better world? 
So for me, I'm a big believer in the power of storytelling. I think if you share your own experiences with other people, then they realize they're not alone, and there's a sense of community that grows together, and you can work together to address those issues. Um, some of that is just like talking around, um, you know, the table with your friends while you're out having dinner, and some of it is really um, speaking out in your community and being a voice for change. One of the things you absolutely can do uh, is join us at the Women's Bureau. We'd love to hear from you. We have on our website a place for you to be able to share your story because we want to be able to capture and tell the, uh, the whole country what it's like to be a woman working here. So, as I said, we are not partisan, but we are political. And we all need to realize that we have to use our political voice. Here in California, you're fortunate. Your elected officials probably represent what you want them to represent in, in, in your state house and in Congress. But there are other places across the country where we need more support. We need you to call your friends who live in, I live in Virginia, who live in other states and talk about, okay, you need to go show up and vote. You need to vote for the people who vote, who will believe in your best interest. I don't care what party you're from, if you support equality, I support you. And I want to see that at the ballot, and I want to see that when you're, when you're making your choice. The other thing, besides voting and being a uh, accountable like in these elections, is really supporting each other and supporting the organizations that are doing the work on the ground to make these things happen. Go to our website, ERA Coalition, you will find over 300 partner organizations that you can that you can join, be a part of, and support to advance this cause and this mission. But let's not sit back and wait for someone else to make a decision about our future. Let's go out there and make our voices heard, vote, get other people to do the same thing, and make sure we're all engaged in this because all of our future is at stake right so go out there and make the change you want to see. Yeah. I already did my call to action. Everybody take this back with you. If you haven't signed the Equal Pay Pledge, please do it. It's a QR code. Um, and then my, my sort of final thought, in, you know, parting it words is, you know, I think when women dare to act big, we have to work to make sure that we don't make them look small. And I know that from, um, that's not my quote, um, but that is something that I've read that I think is just, it's really powerful. Because while we're doing this work, or we're trying to like combat these systemic issues, we need to support each other. And that just doesn't mean just showing up, it means rolling up the sleeves, doing the work, getting involved in your community, doing your part. Gail Golden. Zakia Thomas and Holly Martinez, I want to really sincerely thank all three of you and Zakia Thomas and Zakia Thomas.